of strategy as the Rumi initiative, uh, independent speaker and moderator on human technology. I was showing you the website, uh, rumi.org. Uh, feel free to have a look at their uh, great uh, initiatives. Trishala is fueled by work that enables her to create and promote shared prosperity, feed her curiosity and contribute to organizational growth. Her background is in growing technology companies through partnerships, business strategy, market analysis and research. Over the years, she has gained deep knowledge and practical experience in working closely with celebrated big and emerging technology companies to help the world's most influential organizations assess complex problems, identify the right use cases where AI can be helpful, make the business case and strategy to support AI at scale. Her involvement in tech, combined with her experience as a community builder, led her to quickly realize the vast opportunities and challenges tied to technology, namely to critical, time-bound need to better align technology and its many gains with humanity especially the needs of our most vulnerable populations. She's now spending her time as Rumi's Director of Strategy, working toward bringing the, this gap, focusing on quality education. Outside of this, Trishala is the speaker and moderator of high-stake public discussions on humane technology and impact human AI collaboration will have on society and work. AI commercialization and new kind of business that combines profit and purpose. She has contributed to over 40 leading forums across America. Actually, this is how we meet at the Toronto Machine Learning Summit not a long time ago. She sits on the advisory council of the University of Waterloo's Social Impact Discovery Lab and B-Lab Certified Benefit Corporation Movement for East Central Canada. Trishala, thank you very much for joining us tonight and feel free to take control of the presentation. Awesome, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen first. This is my first virtual keynote I'm giving, so apologies if there are any glitches, even though I do work in tech. Um, so thank you, Dragos, for the introduction and for providing me with the setup to do this talk that we planned months ago, as you said, um, when the world was a very different place. Um, AI Geeks has done an incredible job keeping those of us who love in-person community events sane, um, so your efforts are definitely appreciated. Um, I'm excited to be here with all of you today. If you've attended an AI Geeks event before, you'll know that Dragos' prompt to speakers is um, unlike any event organizer's prompt I've heard before. All he says is speak about something related to AI that you're passionate about. And I absolutely love how open that is because it gave me the opportunity to research my passion that includes but also extends beyond my day to day. Um, and it allows me to explore new dimensions. Um, so with this said, I do want to say that my talk is my way of planting the seed for a much bigger, larger conversation. Um, I'm by no means an expert. I'm also not an engineer or an AI developer. So I usually emphasize this in my talks because I feel strongly that AI needs to be democratized um, to help more people understand it and embrace its potential. Um, and this is only gonna be possible if we make space for different perspectives through multiple disciplines. Uh, lastly, I'm as excited to listen to your thoughts and ideas as I am to share mine. Uh, there will be time, as Dragos mentioned at the end for a discussion, but definitely feel free to use the Q&A tool um, as and when questions come, put it in there and we can definitely tackle it. So my agenda for today, is to spend some time up front framing the problem that I'm working towards at the moment, um, framing Rumi and where we fit in and talking about the role tech plays in the solution, uh, and then specifically going into the AI and machine learning aspect of it. So as Dragos mentioned, I've spent the past two years knee deep in commercializing AI applications within an enterprise landscape. And due to the nature of the work I was doing at the time, I was fortunate to be a part of many conversations inside big tech offices um, at numerous conferences and playing a consultative role to many influential companies across industries, um, essentially selling them onto AI with an iterative long-term strategy to support it at scale. Uh, there's no denying that it was exciting and rewarding in its own way, but my greatest passion has always been about helping people who have typically been left out or underserved. And on that front, I struggled to find a strong overlap. Um, it took walking through the hallways of CES um, earlier this year to put things into perspective. 
Um, the technology itself is fascinating and there is so much to gain from it, but applications remain narrow in terms of what's mainstream, commercialized and in the hands of users. And I don't mean narrow in a technical sense. I mean narrow because we haven't fully explored or rather prioritized exploring the depth of humanity's most critical needs with those who understand it best, like NGOs, governments, nonprofits, think tanks, um, especially the needs of those most vulnerable. Nor have we explored how we can align AI's potential with those needs. So as a result, there is a surge of unnecessary inventions with minimal utility um, that you'll still want, but we should diversify these inventions to serve more people. So the human need we're focusing on today is human learning. I use the word learning deliberately because it is not the same as being in school and gaining a formal education. Um, so why learning and not education? So world over, there are many children who are in schools and not learning due to a range of factors, overcrowded classrooms, not enough teachers, disruptions. Our current education system is built on the industrial revolution model, which focuses on IQ. So learning allows us to update old systems for job readiness, the creation of long-term economic value, and the ability to compete against smart machines by doubling down on uniquely human skills. Learning is also for everyone. You know, you don't need to be enrolled in a school or a higher education institution to benefit from learning. It should happen anywhere and be continuous, much like our machine learning models, actually. So I think it makes a great parallel analogy. When it comes to learning, we're facing a global learning crisis that is costing us $129 billion a year. More than one half of the children and adolescents in the world are not learning. 750 million adults are illiterate and do not have the ability to improve their, their or their children's living conditions. Our current trends project that it will take two, to, until 2072 for all the poorest young women in developing countries to be literate, and possibly until the next century for all girls from the poorest families in sub-Saharan Africa to finish lower secondary school. By the way, none of this guarantees success in a world that is volatile, changing, ambiguous, and uncertain. So the bottom line is the statistics are staggering and they are everywhere. You know, the world's most vulnerable populations, especially women and girls, are hurting the most. We cannot bet on just education, especially in our world where the value of traditional credentials and establishments is being consistently challenged. And we need to lean into learning to bridge the gap that just cannot wait. And these gaps are getting wider every day and rapidly due to the pandemic. Not only is the digital divide amplified right now, but so are other divides like the economic divide, health inequities, and so we need to move quickly and smartly. One last thought on framing the problem here. We often think that vulnerable communities are those in underdeveloped nations or low income GDP regions. It doesn't happen here to that extent. But the pandemic is actually forcing Canada to confront many of our hidden social inequalities. There are so many people in our country today, even in urban areas, that do not have internet at home, and even more people who don't have reliable internet access or devices. Many are resorting to Tim Hortons for public Wi-Fi instead, among other loopholes in the system. Forget Canada. In California, one of the wealthiest states in the US, in part thanks to the booming tech economy, 20% of students can't get on the internet. Um, so it's definitely some food for thought on the state of affairs globally. So Rumi is a Canadian technology nonprofit dedicated to removing unfair barriers to learning for underserved communities. Some of the technological barriers we've seen come down to three things. Um, it's usually access to a device, access to connectivity and data, learning materials that are relevant to a learner's needs. We have over a decade of experience in working at the intersection of technology and learning, um, and one core goal as a nonprofit, which is to serve public interest. We work with the world's most trusted and influential organizations to create and organize and distribute free microlearning called Bytes on 21st century skills. So think digital literacy, um, entrepreneurial skills, collaboration, um, all of which are designed to meet the needs of modern learners. These high stakes skills will form the foundation of 80% of the jobs of the future, as per the World Economic Forum, yet we're not formally trained on them. So while the education technology market focused on K-12 curriculum is getting saturated for good reasons, the lifelong learning technology market is just getting started. So we now understand the importance of 21st century skills, 
which is tied to preparing um, individuals for the job market, uh, success in an uncertain world, enabling you to create non-traditional opportunities for yourself to thrive. But why bites? So we strongly believe that bite-sized learning is going to be the next chapter of the learning revolution. The way we consume information has changed a lot over the past 20 years. There's no need to save up for an expensive set of encyclopedia and search its pages. Now we can find almost anything online. And usually we can access it from the phones in our pocket to our tablets. The economic cost of data and basic devices are going down every year. In fact, over 45% of the world's population owns a smartphone today. And while there are still many people who need devices and connectivity, large corporations and governments are also prioritizing forming partnerships and allocating resources uh, to distribution of mobile devices over other form factors and access to data, which is helping get us more people online. As a result, there is and continues to be a mobile learning revolution, allowing us to reach learners in new ways and provide more interactivity to enrich content. Designing content in a format that is digestible and consumable in short snippets becomes crucial. There's a slim chance of effective learning and retention if we're expecting users to complete hefty courses um, traditionally designed for desktop on devices with, I, I wouldn't say constraints, but fundamentally different design considerations. Our attention spans have shrunk as expectations have grown. And by breaking down um, content into short focused bites, we can reduce the cognitive load on learners and empower them to really absorb the materials. Our tech solutions, Rumi Build, Rumi Learn, and Rumi Connect, empower over 50,000 learners from vulnerable populations in over 29 countries. From Syrian refugee camps to remote Canadian indigenous communities, we're committed to empowering 10 million underserved learners worldwide by 2025. Now that might seem like a very ambitious goal to reach in five years, um, but I'm sure this group over others know well that AI and machine learning can help us amplify and scale our impact exponentially as we have more data and our algorithms get smarter, while our humans do as well. So how does AI tie into all of this? So AI has a role both in understanding and promoting learning for an individual. Learning has always been about process. As a result, much of our technology application has been targeted towards enhancing, refining, or automating parts of the process. AI gives us an opportunity to connect and shift the focus to learning outcomes by enabling us to capture and make sense of data. There is an air of serendipity in the fact that while artificial intelligence is a big cause of this disruption, it's also the solution for navigating it. We're going to explore um, in my talk today, theoretically, where AI can play a role in some of the opportunities. I'm narrowing down on specifically five, um, and each one warrants a talk of its own, but we can definitely start by scraping the surface. So the first opportunity lies in equipping us with data on learner needs that inform content categories and insights, and then ultimately shape learner experiences. So one of the big reasons why the learning crisis persists is that many traditional education systems, typically offline across the developing world, have little data on who is learning, who is not, among other things. As a result, it's hard for them to do anything about the crisis. The beauty of Bytes is that they allow us to capture a wealth of data related to learner behaviors, data tied to what learners spend time on, um, the content categories they're most interested in, how that differs for geographic region or neighborhood, where they lose interest, which topics do they struggle to grasp, what, what is their current learning level, when do they typically learn, how do they spend learn, uh, their time learning, and, and when do they learn, um, how do their needs vary within a household or neighborhood, how do content needs and consumption change with age or by gender. And all of these data points help us to in, uh, and informs a system of iterative improvements. The result is a medium that meets the needs of modern learners and gets better over time, enabling us to make targeted recommendations and in some cases surface what they need without them having to type it in or search um, for these learners the same way that Netflix, YouTube, or Amazon does so. All of this allows us to enhance learning outcomes through adaptive learning algorithms that can mimic real world cognitive moments. This level of customization and learning is impossible for current education systems and curriculums. 
Another benefit as well of this surge of data um, is being able to report impact metrics. Um, so as a nonprofit, we obviously have different funding mechanisms. And so for us, being able to report metrics that our corporate partners are looking at um, through the, in, when it comes to the usage or consumption of the bytes they're creating um, becomes really critical. So the access to um, all this data definitely helps us serve more than one purpose. The second point is automating content organization and creation. So our model involves, as I said, employees within Fortune 500s and independent volunteers authoring these bytes. Learner experiences and outcomes are heavily influenced by how we organize their bytes. An important piece of context is that learning usually happens for two reasons, to fulfill a need. So I need to know X, so I'm gonna search Y, or for leisure to satisfy curiosity, much like what we're all doing here today. So organizing content in a way that makes it as easy for users to find what they're looking for and makes it pleasurable is critical. Content organization can be a tedious process, especially as the volume increases. And our team's time is better suited elsewhere than putting content into existing or new categories. So given that our bytes are by default structured and authors of bytes create content in, in a specific format, once we accumulate enough bytes and data, this will be extremely beneficial both to our team and the end learners, given the amount of structured data we will have. Content creation is the other piece of the puzzle. So AI content creation engines will allow us to ramp up the volume of content while maintaining or perhaps even enhancing the quality. It gives us the opportunity to analyze other sources and repositories where human insights on 21st century life or career skills live and automatically format those content into bytes. Some of these sources could be articles, um, reports, or one that I'm particularly excited about would be conversations through speech or audio um, to text transcriptions. Possibly, um, all the possibilities are really exciting. But again, going back to my earlier point, through detailed analytics on learner engagement and response, um, the algorithms will, will learn what works best in content creation and optimize content at the individual learner level personal AI coaches and assistants. So ensuring the best high quality teachers reach the learners who need them most is a huge challenge contributing to the learning crisis. Despite incentives, it is often difficult to get the best teachers to work in remote to underserved areas. Best aside, um, schools in remote low income neighborhoods are often understaffed with one teacher handling more than 40 to 50 children at one time. AI coaches that engage with each learner in the most beneficial way based on the learner's personality, interests, and our needs um, is game-changing for the world's most vulnerable, offering differentiated learning. An AI coach can devise self-directed learning plans, keeping learners accountable for their own growth, um, that keep individual pace, progression, and gaps in knowledge in mind. An AI coach can surface content you're looking for through enhanced voice search capabilities. So you don't need to necessarily sit and scroll through pages of content if you know exactly what you're looking for. Um, testing as we know it today will be replaced in our learning context with the ability to apply the mastered knowledge in a curated, meaningful simulation. There will always be a need for human guidance, but an AI coach, whether that's text, voice-based, multimodal, um, gives learners control over their learning experience and it boosts their confidence and overall love for learning. So for chat, voice, and video-based AI assistants, um, leveraging emotional sentiment analysis through recognizing signs of frustration or excitement um, in the way they're communicating with our platform, for instance, can further contribute to a very individualized learning experience. This one I'm, I'm most passionate about, and that's improving access to learning. The outcome of AI-enabled learning that I'm most excited about is access. AI can help make learning possible for those who traditionally have been left out. Um, for instance, those who speak different languages through multilingual capabilities and language translation, or infusing machine learning models with data on specific regional dialects or unofficial languages. For context, there are hundreds of unofficial languages and many larger technology platforms support a fraction of the world's official languages, yet alone unofficial languages. Outside of language capabilities, access to learning also means including and in meeting the needs of learners who might have visual or hearing impairments through leveraging speech to text, text to speech capabilities, rich audio descriptions, voice skills, actions or custom applications, closed captioning personalization, auditory AI assistance, um, enhanced language prediction, we're able to really take life and learning to new heights. 
Rewarding and enhancing learning through gamification. So AI-enabled learning pushes us to move away from rewarding memorization to instead rewarding curiosity and experimentation, which are the building blocks of discovering and understanding the things we do not know yet. Um, personally, Duolingo, the language learning app, is a fantastic example of gamification. So please download it if you're not on it yet and try it out to truly experience the bliss of, of gamification. AI gamification is an effective technique to engage learners. It's all about using the principles and key elements of gaming to meet learning objectives. Gamification techniques are intended to leverage people's natural desire for socializing, learning, achievement, self-expression, altruism. The types of rewards we have um, include you know, points, achievement badges or levels, leaderboards, filling of a progress bar, or perhaps even providing the user with virtual currency. Um, for example, making the rewards for accomplishing um, tasks visible to other learners or providing leaderboards are a great way of encouraging other learners to compete. As per the e-learning industry's latest report, 80% of learners claimed learning would be more productive if it, if it were more game oriented. Um, and there are many other benefits to gamifying learning, um, such as higher recall, better retention, reinforcement, uh, and influencing behavior change, which are all really critical aspects of, of um, bridging that learning crisis. Lastly, omni-channel learning. So earlier in my career, I worked at Shopify where I spent all my time understanding and selling omni-channel commerce experiences. Reaching a customer through multiple channels and providing an integrated experience across all these channels um, enhances the customer experience, allowing us to help them help us meet customers where they are. So, so what does omni-channel mean in the context of learning and why is it so important? It's important for the exact same reasons why omnichannel commerce is important for customers. It leads to a better learner experience. Omnichannel is on um, us. It should never be about forcing learners onto different channels, nor is it about making it their goal. Omnichannel learning is blended learning, blending and integrating both online and offline learning channels, as well as any learning channel a learner might adopt. When we think of omnichannel, it's so easy and almost natural to default to high tech. Um, like voice, chat, AR, and VR. But to serve the needs of the most vulnerable, it is so important to lean into low tech. My personal stance is that there is always going to be a low tech and room for low tech to play a critical role. Individuals today, no matter where they are in the world, are learning across multiple channels, desktop, mobile, online tutoring, in-person, fax, radio, paper, are still very much prevalent channels of learning. It's important to think critically about building unified um, interfaces. And this is one of the huge benefits of Bytes because their formatting and format can be easily adapted to different channels naturally. So that kind of takes us to the end of, of the, my talk. And to summarize, we learned a bit about the world's learning crisis, why it exists, five key trends we'll see in the AI-enabled transformation of learning, um, which is capturing data to inform critical decisions, automating content organization and creation, AI coaches and assistants, improving access, rewarding learning through gamification, um, and lastly, omni-channel learning. To summarize, I cannot stress enough the importance of making sure that while most of the corporate and tech world is running after making machines smarter, we shouldn't forget to look after and invest in the human minds they were built to replicate. The human mind will always be superior. I want to end with this quote um, that I found on the latest deep learning um, newsletter by the founder of Coursera. And he said, when the pandemic is over, hundreds of millions of learners um, around the world will have picked up the habit of learning online. This is an opportunity to rebuild society's trust in science, reason, and each other. The momentum could drive a new golden age of learning and it's not too early to start preparing. Let's make sure we keep working towards democratizing access to education and make our society more fair and, equip and equitable. Thank you for attending. Uh, definitely feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn or Twitter. I'm pretty sure there's only one Trishala that works at Rumi. Um, and I guess we'll open the floor to discussion now. I do also want to mention, um, as I am not a technologist, but I do want your technical questions answered. I've asked Rumi CTO Bogdan to join us. So I will give him permissions to be able to respond as well. And hopefully we can answer all of your questions. All right, 
going to pull up the chat. Okay. So the first question is from Jim Miller at RBC. Have you been required to tune any of your existing algorithms to account for the new world that we see ourselves currently in? Or were they robust enough on their own? Bhaktan, do you want to take that one? Yeah, sure. So uh, yeah, I mean, we're a digital first experience. We've always been that way. So nothing has really changed about COVID uh, in any of the offering that we have, other than to say that there's more demand for it. Um, the next question is from Faraz. Oh, I know this. I know for us from Toronto Machine Learning Summit. Um, how do you take into account markets, learners, if they don't have a good internet connection? How does that impact the algorithms deployment and updating? Um, I'll definitely let Bogdan tackle that from an infrastructure perspective. Yes, so it, it definitely it affects everything. Obviously, it makes everything 10 times harder, right? So um, what we do is um, we built a model of how we best serve in a completely dynamic if they had reliable um, internet and then we create breaks in the experience um, and then separate those breaks so we can say like okay like uh, depending on this particular uh, uh, set of data what would be best served for this uh, audience um, and then we adapt that to an offline environment so um, yeah it makes everything a lot harder um, it's not as uh, good and as reliable but it's still possible like the, the foundational things that are um, that you're doing in a completely dynamic environment, you're still able to do for the most part. It's just not as uh, obviously not as robust or as like as dynamic as you would assume. Awesome. Selena, so you mentioned that the content in an individual byte is in a certain format. What are the main aspects of this format that make it good for learning? Awesome. These are all great Bogdan questions because he's fun. <laughs> yeah. So there's a there's a uh, there's a factor of things that make them great for learning. So timeliness is a big one. Uh, Trishala touched touched on that. Um, bytes come in three, six, and nine minute uh, intervals essentially. Uh, experiences. Um, other things about it. There's uh, instructional design elements that are like casually built in. Um, by by casual, I mean the fact that they're not like so apparent to the learner but there's a strong sense of consistency to the byte. So for example, every byte is substantiated with data, right? So like there's a, there's a, there's a, a, a section where you're basically, you're, you're given a broader context to the byte. Like why should you learn this thing? Which I think is, is missing in a lot of learning experiences because you don't really understand the context. Okay, like they're assuming that you've already made the decision that like I'm gonna go learn this thing. But for the most part, when people approach learning experiences, they haven't made that decision. Um, other things, it's like, uh, you know, that you have to layer uh, measurement and, uh, and evaluation things within the experience, but it layered it in an interactive way, right? So like, um, you know, you're not like, here's a bunch of content and then you're going to quiz, you're going to do a quiz at the end of the entire content, right? Which is a very like traditional learning model. Uh, you want to enter in, like, you want to substantiate and reinforce um, the things that you're learning with the content in a very light, uh, interactive way. Um, other things are like um, connection between bytes, right? So like um, because we connect bytes in, into uh, a very specific tree, but also to each other, um, there's obviously strong ways that you can uh, enforce sort of learner mechanics and uh, ascension through how you connect the bytes. So I hope that yeah, and something else I'll mention. So if anyone um, wants to kind of experience what a byte is like in terms of the format. We actually created a byte um, that describes what a byte is. So if you reach out to me on LinkedIn or through email, um, I'm happy to share that link so you can kind of experience it for yourself and it becomes really clear. Um, any questions on format will be clarified that way. Um, the next question is from Salim. What is your most important product differentiation from Coursera? That's a great question. So Coursera is more focused, even though you know it's online learning, um, it's still courses. There's still some element of a curriculum. It's still formal in some sense. For us, we're focused primarily on informal learning, on life career skills. So it's not content on machine learning, for instance, or on deep learning neural networks. It's content on human skills um, that we will be increasingly more reliant on um, in the now, but more so 
so in the future. Um, another differentiation is the actual um, experience as well for the end learner. So as Bogdan was mentioning, uh, mentioning earlier, a bite can be consumed in three, six, or nine minutes. Um, it's meant to be consumed on the go. It's fundamentally a different offering to what Coursera offers. Um, I don't think, you know, we are competitive to Coursera. In fact, there are areas where we could potentially collaborate and work together to reformat some of their content into more consumable, digestible bites. But that's my personal take. It's that we're focused on on-the-go learning, on life skills. And the other big differentiator, frankly, is our focus on um, the market we're serving. We are primarily focused on making the lives um, or the learning possible for the world's most vulnerable communities. And unfortunately in tech, um, you know, very few organizations uh, lead with that mission and design specifically for those users. Um, as a technology nonprofit, we're not, you know, um, accountable to any public funders or stake shareholders. Um, so that's our prime focus. And I do see that as a unique differentiator. Bogdan, I don't know if you have any additional thoughts on that. Um, I, I think the source of the content is a little bit different. So we're, as Coursera would obviously present you a, a, a course structure that's coming from an established institution. Um, we're more focused on practical skills that are coming from the practitioners that are subject matter experts on a particular thing. So if you're like, you know, for example, you know, if you were to do a Coursera AI course, well, it would come from a, a corporation or an institution that would that's a, you know viewed as an expert on that particular subject matter. We deal with with specific individuals um, that are subject matter experts, and we put them front and center um, by by creating the direct learning mechanics where they don't have to worry about like formatting and like you know and and uh, and, and the instructional design elements of it. They can just focus on like here's some insights that I have to capture. Um, so the the differentiation between like us and, and specifically in content would be like. If, if someone were to approach um, learning about machine learning or about um, AI in general, we'd be the first source that they would, uh, they would uh, interact with to basically get, get a basis of knowledge. It wouldn't be the comprehensive course on like, you know, a specific uh, like, you know, subject matter. Um, next question is also a very bogged in question. Have you considered adaptive learning to enhance the omni-channel experience? Um, yeah, so I mean, like, we're, I'm, I'm pretty familiar with adaptive learning. Um, I think, I mean, you could view this as a form of, um, like, our whole offering is a form of adaptive learning. If you look at the pieces, right, we're working with um, experts with the information that's, that's supposed to be taught. What, what's different about us is that we're, we're focused on capturing attention, um, the learner's attention, and doing it in a very timely way, as much as we are on the mechanics of learning. Right, because the mechanics of learning are obviously like something that you can really focus on, but that you have to look at it holistically. And the fact that like you can have the best freaking learning um, like models and systems and technology, but that's not going to change the fact that like most underserved learners have like literally like in the tens of digits of minutes per day to to have a meaningful learning experience. So like the, those models are great, but if you need five hours a day or two hours a day to really run them then they become uh, moot and obsolete, right? So uh, we're really focused on the experience and capturing people's attention with something that's meaningful. And we do that through like the content, the style of delivery, and all of those things coming together, the timeliness of it all, the fact that it's like largely, they're largely um, uh, independent learning uh, uh, experiences. Whereas like you can do one byte completely separate from another byte. They are um, hierarchical, but at the same time, they are different. So it, it gives a lot of flexibility to the learner so that they're getting maximum value for their time. They don't have to have like a, a basis of, I have to invest a hundred hours or 50 hours to get something meaningful. I can literally get something meaningful, like building blocks where I'm getting something meaningful from this five minute experience and I'm getting something meaningful from this nine minute experience. And all those things built to something that like translates to you um, you know, from working two jobs to one job or from like getting a higher paying job. Like it has to be translated directly to something that's valuable to you. Otherwise people aren't going to do it, right? Like learning for the sake of learning is great, but it's a luxury that like we, you know, most people don't have that are in underserved communities. Awesome. The next question, um, what are the biggest barriers you've come across when implementing AI strategies for large corporations you've worked with? I think the biggest challenge I've come across is 
selling people, um, well, two things, finding the right use case has always been a challenge. I think large organizations and enterprises, when they're looking at use cases they want to work on, um, they tend to be, you know, ones that might um, align with an objective, um, uh, but it's not usually from a user experience standpoint, something that um, a user would. So I was focused primarily on conversational AI, which I think makes my experience slightly unique um, in comparison to maybe selling and consulting on machine learning models. Um, and when it comes to conversational AI specifically, uh, people think they need to build voice skills and voice applications on specific use cases that a user would not even consider using their voice for, if that makes sense. So I think finding the right use case that both aligns with the business um, but also value for your end user is really critical. And it's something a lot of enterprises struggle with because they have so many different objectives they need to balance. Um, the second thing is actually selling organizations into onto a long-term strategy for AI. A lot of companies think it's like a, a done and dusted kind of thing, but machine learning algorithms take months and years to sort of, um, you know, infuse them with data for it to actually have a real value or meaning for your business. Um, so to really align expectations and let stakeholders know that this is going to start very dumb, but over time we're going to make this more intelligent with more structured data um, and more data period um, is the biggest barrier that I've seen. Um, and for that reason, things tend to remain in pilots and there's still limited budgets for um, in AI and machine learning specifically and more being allocated to other uh, more mainstream technologies. Um, there's a lot of other barriers in general with working with larger enterprises, um, but it also like is heavily affected by the industry a company operates in. Um, particular industries like say really regulated industries often will have a bigger challenge with AI because of data considerations, privacy, security, that, that applies regardless of which industry you're in, but more so in those regulated industries, um, it can be a huge barrier to moving quickly. Um, but yeah, those are just some general thoughts on that. SEP, I know SEP. Um, some nations are addressing Sustainable Development Goal 4, which is um, quality education and promoting lifelong learning uh, by experimenting with AI in the classroom at an institutional level. While the implications are yet to be seen, do you envision AI in our GTA school boards in the next five to 10 years? Um, I think I'll definitely like Bogdan would love to hear your thoughts, but if I had to say something really quickly on this, I think um, in a normal world, probably uh, not five to 10 years, I think it would, um, I wouldn't put a timeline with it, but I think in general, uh, being open to adopting new technologies would have been a much bigger challenge in life before coronavirus came. Um, I think now the pandemic has really pushed organizations, institutions, individuals um, outside of their comfort zones. And I think now we've been in such a prolonged period of, of remote learning that it's going to be um, really, you know, difficult to uh, turn back to old habits. Um, I think people have really realized the benefits that they can um, gain from, from having more tech in their curriculums or infused in their classrooms. Um, it's also been a long enough period now to develop new habits, um, as I mentioned in that quote by the founder of Coursera. So I think the life post pandemic is going to be very um, interesting for school boards and potentially this might, you know, push them to really think critically about um, making some long term changes. Bogdan, I don't know if you have thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the, the barriers to that are probably bureaucratic and political more than they are anything else. Um, I mean, without getting into too many details on that, but I think definitely like one of the things that, that have, uh, like that COVID has changed is that there's obviously a, uh, that, that paradigm and that dynamic has completely changed and there probably is, there's gonna be a lot of pressure to um, maybe not necessarily convert like the entirety of the, of the school system to some form of online um, learning, but definitely a, a strong component or a strong percentage of it will be in the next five years for sure. Yeah, and we're already seeing a lot of, um, well, the government, but a lot of other even um, like uh, pri public organizations um, commit to distributing resources. So whether that's devices, connectivity, um, a lot is being done right now to make it easier for classrooms in every corner of the country uh, to have access to more resources for their students. So 
hopefully, I mean, only time will tell, but I think this should be, um, uh, you know, the, the bureaucracy aside, as Bob to mention, um, I think the pandemic, it can be a huge sort of turning point um, for education as we know it. Paul says, just curious, would you like to briefly describe your software side of things? Like what kind of platform languages, most common AI models are used and applied? Um, and how about the team structure? Yeah, um, so uh, we run, we operate this part of our, um, our uh, like the, the learn part, which is the, the actual, um, like the, the actual interface that, that uh, learners inter uh, interact with. We, we uh, run that all on AWS. Um, in terms of that stack, it's like Node with, uh, with uh, Vue uh, for the front end of it. Um, we use a data pipeline that is, um, right now it's based on segment. So um, we track segment events uh, out of that data, pipe it to uh, a variety of places. We actually like paralyze, paralyze it. So some of it is used in, uh, in the relational databases and we actually like pull some data out of that. Some of it is, uh, is sent straight through S3 and then we use Athena to do some analysis on that. Um, we use, uh, so the generic model, um, there's, a, there's a couple of different things that we do. Um, internally, like the actual developers, some of our development resources are spent on um, converting some of the um, some of the data insights that we find into actual like algorithms that uh, are implemented in Node. Um, but we also have data scientists that are um, on a volunteer basis um, that work with the data um, in a variety of ways to kind of pull insights out of that. Some of that is actually like, uh, um, some of it is on TensorFlow, um, some of it is, um, is on R. Uh, it depends on like the various like people that are working with it. Um, what we try to do is we, we enable kind of, um, number one, have a generic data pipeline that allows people to like uh, work with all the data that we have really easily without us like building a lot of custom stuff. Um, and also um, ultimately the, the models all lead back to uh, essentially like we track content and the relationships to content uh, in Neo4j. And um, we, the algorithms work on serving models that are, that are formed um, by metadata on the Neo4j um, nodes. So, you know, to give you a, like a practical example, the popularity of one byte um, is tracked on like various levels on, on various projects. So like, you know, one specific project in, you know, Ontario will be managed completely different um, you know, completely differently from a project in like East Africa, for example. Um, we integrate some of that data to establish like global popularity of stuff, but it's also managed on an individual project level. Um, in the serving models, we have like a popularity index that we consider as part of the serving algorithm. And that metadata is updated by some of these like uh, pipelines. Um, so when, you know, a data scientist like takes a look at that data, we essentially have, uh, it's either updating a, a metadata on a particular byte of uh, something that we already have, or we're creating new metadata for bytes that um, obviously we can use to make, to refine the process. Uh, that makes sense. Awesome. Um, the next question is from Abdul. Is AI going to cooperate or compete with humans? Um, I kind of put some thoughts on this in the chat. Um, my personal viewpoint is that there's always going to be room for humans. I don't think machines are at or will ever be at a point where um, they can teach humans um, skills that are uniquely human. So things like resilience, creativity, empathy, um, I think these are all things that can only be um, learned or shared through human insights, which is very much what our model is rooted in, bringing human insights on those topics to consumer, uh, to learners um, through bytes is our focus. So I, I think there's always going to be room for the human. We've made a very deliberate effort um, to keep humans very central to our model, even though we are working with AI. Um, and I think at the end of the day, it comes down to really remembering that AI is built and developed by humans. Um, so, you know, we need to build them responsibly and keep, um, and also make sure we're applying it, as I mentioned earlier on in my talk, to relevant human um, issues and needs 
to really reap the gains from it. Um, but yeah, that's my personal standpoint. I'm happy to talk more about that as well, um, separately offline. The next question, who are your next underserved populations to focus on? Um, so we don't really you know, have a laundry list of communities that we're trying to help. Um, there are some like by virtue of uh, like geographic proximity. Of course, we're working with communities in you know, the US and Canada um, and you know, close to us, communities that are near, but we're also you know, working in 29 countries across the globe. So right from Afghanistan uh, to Pakistan, there are many different places where we work with NGOs who run um, the distribution and training on the ground. Uh, so for us, in terms of, I guess, priorities that dictate who we serve, um, now, in light of the pandemic, our focus has really been on supporting Indigenous communities here in Canada. Um, we've worked to launch an Indigenous coalition of content uh, alongside a few other NGO and nonprofit partners. So that's been a huge focus for us right now. But generally speaking, if I were to kind of put our um, population in a group, um, one group we are definitely very um, occupied with would be offline communities. So as I mentioned, there are many individuals across the globe that do not have access to internet or data. Um, so we're working with a lot of, you know, infrastructure partners and having conversations around how um, we can actually see uh, or have Rumi um, be, you know, a, a point of information in public uh, Wi-Fi environments, for instance. So there's a couple of different avenues we're looking at to really support um, reaching those offline communities. We also, Ruby solutions are also built for offline usage. Um, so there's quite a bit we're doing to tackle those communities. But in terms of, you know, who we're focusing on next, um, everyone is an equal priority for us. Uh, so we aren't really focused on a particular, um, you know, target market or anything. It's all um, a fair game and open market for us. Um, okay, next question. How do you deal with people with very limited basic knowledge? Bogdan, do you want to take that one? Yeah, so we, I mean, part of the foundational bites that we have are um, start with very foundational like knowledge. So things as simple as like how to use a mouse, how to type on a keyboard, right? So, and we deliver those and obviously because of the formatting, we can deliver those in a very like graphical way. You don't need to, you don't need like deep understanding of like language to to be able to like grasp those concepts. So we start with that and, uh, and, um, and, and obviously like within an environment, but within a, a delivery environment that's like comfortable to the user. So like we obviously want to deliver this on a device that they're comfortable with and that they already use so that they're, they can focus on the content and the content obviously being like very, very simple, straightforward, media rich, you know, you're uh, vertically scroll scrolling. You don't have to interact with too many buttons. Um, it's a, there's a very clear start, there's a very clear end, uh, et cetera, et cetera, so. Awesome. The next question is, who do you envision as your typical learner? How old are they? Where do they live? And what do they mainly want to learn? So, I, I, I mean, I, I think that's one of the reasons that uh, machine learning is, is so important to this and AI in general is that um, we are, like, we, we know those typical learners. Um, in very specific projects, right? So a project in Northern Ontario with a indigenous community, we have a good idea of under, understanding of like what the that learner archetype looks like, but that learner archetype will be completely different um, in Cambodia um, in an NGO that's like delivering learning with skating, right? So um, the divergence of that is so extreme across so many different projects that we need like a 20,000 person organization to manage those differences. So that's why like the data models and, and making the learning empowered with data um, and, and, and having like rich data sources in terms of both the, the behavior, but also the behavior of like how people, how learners are interacting with the content, completion rates of content, et cetera, survey results, et cetera, but also external data sources, right? Like what is, uh, which is something that well, it's, uh, is in our, our, our pipeline of, of uh, integrating. So like in a specific area, what are the most in-demand jobs that, uh, that someone should learn about, right? Um, what, what, what are the highest deltas in salaries on a particular vocation? And how does that translate back into content that's maybe useful to someone today, right? So 
um, those are part of the things that make learning useful to a particular learner um, outside of just the actual content itself and the mechanics of how you're intaking that content. Awesome. Last two questions. Oh, three questions. Okay. On a scale of one to 10, with one being little and 10 being ultimate, how much control of your life might you concede to allowing emerging technology and steering your life choices and experiences? I think it's an important concept to, to explore in this case. Um, but I think for us, it definitely comes down to, um, or at least for me personally, how I viewed it is what are you willing to give up in exchange for something that will actually enhance your life? Um, I think, you know, the control aspect of machine learning and AI is very much a personal choice. Um, and organizations these days should make that a personal choice. I know that as and when we continue to collect a lot of data or embed more personalization and, um, you know, recommendations in our system, we're definitely approaching it from a standpoint of giving um, learners the ability to opt in and opt out. Um, the control is very much still going to always be um, on them in terms of controlling their learning experiences. Bogdan, I don't know if you have mo more thoughts on just um, like control in an increasingly like um, uh, AI enabled world. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm not sure. I, I mean, on a personal level, I don't think I would concede too much control. I think there's a balance, right? Like you want to control, you want to see control on the things that like are meaningless to you, right? Because it's like, they're just uh, procedural things, right? And I would probably concede a lot of control in that sense, because like, I just don't care. And then you want to recapture the control on the things that are meaningful to you. Obviously, that, that varies for some people versus other people. But I mean, like, that's my personal, I, I think, like, the more empowerment that we can do and say, like, look, these are your options, but you don't, you know, you, you should be able to have the ultimate control of how much you see it in what context. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay, speaking of gamified learning, was wondering how AI may go about reducing the risk of dopamine addiction that comes from gamification. Um, so, I mean, from a Rumi perspective, um, and our use of gamification uh, now or in the future, I'd say, like, for us, um, we're not, like, monetizing any of the rewards or gamification techniques we're using. As a nonprofit, we are strictly embedding gamification into our um, platform to serve learner needs and encourage positive behaviors. Um, so for us, we don't, in our context of learning and the kind of nature of the work we're doing, we won't necessarily have to, you know, we're not rewarding behaviors um, that are harmful. Um, it's all rewarding learning outcomes. So in that regard, um, you know, we, I don't have a lot of thoughts uh, specifically to our line of work. Uh, in general, though, I would say, you know, a lot of um, addiction when it comes to gamification is um, also related to design considerations. Um, so it comes back to, for instance, like um, with Netflix, like the whole, you know, dark screens make you sort of go into a wormhole and just continue to um, take in all the content in the world. So there's little design considerations as well, similarly, when you're looking at gamifying a platform um, that I think we need to assess critically and responsibly um, in our development. But otherwise, I don't know, Bogdan, do you have any thoughts on risks of addiction um, from gamification? I, I mean, community? truthfully, I took, a, I took a screenshot of your, uh, of your question. I'm going to send it to one of uh, a, a psychology PhD students. This is a better psychology question than it is a technical question, or it's a marriage between tech, technology and psychology, right? Um, where I think that like we should be like the technologists that are implementing these things should be aware of like the boundaries of the psychology and to understand like don't cross this threshold. And obviously, like, we haven't been as good as we should have been um, thus far or as cognizant of that um, um, because, like, ultimately, like, everybody's trying to get, like, maximum engagement. Um, but, it, you know, it's, it's definitely led to, like, fatigue and it definitely led to, um, you know, for example, when you talk about microtransactions and those types of economies in gaming, it's definitely led to very negative experiences, right? So... Um, I, I think there's a, a way of collaborating between like psychologists and technologists to establish like probably clear guidelines uh, on uh, on just like implementation. Obviously, in our context, um, you know, despite the fact that we're we're incentivizing um, behavior that we traditionally morally would would say is like good behavior because learn, more learning is probably better than going you know more videos on TikTok. Um, even though that's like obviously a, a, a sort of a, a, a moral like lens or frame on it, um, it would still want to be aware and cognizant and, and work that into our models for sure. 
Okay, last two questions. So I imagine learners have only um, access to a variety of very outdated uh, devices, so like PCs, phones. How do you cater to them? So our solutions are actually built to be consumed on any device. Um, I know we, you know, mobile first is kind of what we're leading with. Um, but we traditionally, if you look back at Brumi's history, we started with tablets. We were actually manufacturing and distributing tablets because that's where technology was at um, back in those days. Uh, but for us, yeah, our, our content is very much um, designed keeping all form factors in mind. Um, in terms of how we actually support um, users in getting access to devices, we work with a network of recycled device programs, um, which is better for the environment. Um, and they're looking for access to individuals who really need these devices. So it's a perfect partnership. Um, so one of the partners we work with would be an organization called EcoATM. Um, and so we actually did a pop-up store with them in New York before um, you know, lockdown and restrictions happened. Um, so, so there's a lot of you know, partnerships in that space to help us um, distribute recycled devices to these learners and communities. Uh, but otherwise, with whatever they have, um, they're still able to access our content. And like I said, it's also designed keeping offline um, in mind. So you can, you know, um, pre-download all the content and, and access it um, in a way that suits you and your environment. Um, okay. Last question. How are you scaling up your content? Yeah, actually, Bogdan, that's a great one for you. Yeah, so uh, in a variety of ways. So like it's a multifaceted kind of approach. One of them is like the primary one is we work with a lot of subject matter experts that are uh, volunteers in learning. So they're learning experts most of the time uh, or learning ecosystem type experts um, that are familiar with, you know, creating micro learning courses in general. And we have a whole volunteer force that we manage to create these learning bites. Um, Another one is um, actual organizations that we partner and work with. So a lot of organizations like NGO specifically have value, uh, very valuable content. Um, and we're starting to make uh, the tools, obviously, since most of our tools are free, um, especially like the learning, like creating a, the, the authoring platform to create a bite and also like the delivery mechanisms. Um, they're basically engaging us and using our tools to self-fulfill. So they're uh, taking and adapting like their traditional content they might have like on some like uh, other LMS system or some are like traditionally created as PDFs or documents or et cetera. And because they see the value of delivering this type of content and making it future proof, uh, they're converting that content and the insights that they have and the knowledge that they have into bytes. Um, and is in doing that to self-fulfill, um, they're also obviously sharing it on our broader library of content. All our content is uh, Creative Commons license, so it becomes like license that anybody can use and without remixing. Um, so that's another one. And then the other one is, is uh, as Trishala also mentioned earlier, is like from our, um, the, our, our corporate partners. So our corporate partners in their engagement with us, um, in their virtual volunteering engagement, the actual result of the engagement is they're creating content for the library, right? So they're taking um, in a uh, two hour workshop, they're taking, uh, they're working together in uh, three to five person teams um, around specific content areas that they're, they're very uh, knowledgeable on. And then the, the output of that volunteering experience is essentially bikes that go into our library that gets delivered into all of our projects. Awesome. So, Jarvis, I think that was the last question. Um, like I said, I'm happy to connect offline um, on any questions you might have on LinkedIn or through email, but that's it from us for today. Thank you very much, uh, Trishala and Bogdan, for uh, joining us tonight. A very interesting uh, topic. And this is basically one of the reasons why we started AI Geeks in the first place. While AI can be used by companies to maybe increase the profit, get more customers, reduce costs, and things like that, in this case, we see how AI is really used to improve people's life in a direct way. So thank you both for joining us. Uh, we will uh, we already answered through the chat, but we'll have a recording of the event and also the deck available in uh, maybe a few days. I'll send it to all the participants.